sorry, my sharing capability is not as good. There we go. Okay, so you should be seeing a screen that says urinary system part one, two, and three. If you don't, tell me. Otherwise, I think that's the same screen that we're all sharing. Let's see. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to do kidney anatomy. This is the list that we're going, you need to know for the kidney anatomy. The parts of the urinary system is obviously we're going to have two kidneys. Each kidney on either side has urine that goes down through the ureters. The ureters bring urine to the bladder and then the bladder brings, um, then when urine leaves the bladder, it goes through the urethra to the outside world. So we'll go through these in a lot more detail, but this is the overview of the basic components. So some of the jobs of the kidney is it regulates our blood volume. So we either retain water in the kidneys or we let water go in the kidneys. And so our plasma volume, if we retain more water, we're obviously going to then increase the pressure because we have more fluid in the blood vessels. So increasing blood volume will also increase in pressure. This is an important concept when we talk about the hormones at the end of today's lecture. Inside the kidney, we have baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are pressure sensors, and if the pressure is too low in the kidneys, it can't do its job of filtering out waste, so it will release renin, which is um, one of the hormones that's going to ultimately cause blood pressure to go up. The kidneys also regulate electrolyte concentrations. If we have, say, too much calcium or an excessive amount of sodium or other ions, then the kidneys can get rid of them. So the it, kidneys can be, is our long-term regulation of the balance of these charged particles. The kidneys also can remove acidic elements. So if we have a really low pH in our body, which means a lot of acidity, the kidney can also get rid of that from our body for us. As, and then waste removal and detoxification, that's probably what most people are aware of as the job of the kidney. So if we have waste, in our blood, the kidney is removing that waste. Um, there's other elements that it's uh, detoxifying and then it's neutralizing, and it's also removing that from our body. And then finally, the kidney also does a process known as erythropoiesis. Urethro should make you remind you of erythrocyte, which is a red blood cell. So the the process of forming new red blood cells is um, actually occurs started in the kidney. So if you guys remember when we did the blood unit, if people went up to higher altitude where there was less oxygen, then red or our bone marrow would actually make more red blood cells. Well, our bone marrow only knows to make our red blood cells because of the chemoreceptors. That means a chemical sensor. Chemoreceptors in the kidney detect oxygen. And so when oxygen levels are low, then the kidney sends out the hormone erythropoietin, and that hormone will target the bone marrow. And then the bone marrow knows then to start making more red blood cells. So the actual sensor for oxygen levels that determines whether you're gonna make more or less red blood cells is located in the kidney. And the hormone that will do that is erythropoietin. So the outside of the kidney is, um, we, it's just located, has a connective tissue layer known as the serosa around the outside. It's located right where the top of the kidney is right below the top, the bottom rib, and it spans the space from about T12 to L3. It's in a chamber behind the peritoneum, so it's not in the bubble that surrounds the intestines. It's actually in a chamber behind it, and that's known as retroperitoneal. And within that chamber, it's actually um, padded in there with a lot of fat and um, areolar connective tissue as well. It has an adrenal gland that sits on top of it. There's a connective tissue outer covering known as the renal capsule. And then the internal part, the medial part of the kidney where the artery and veins are coming and going as well as the ureters is known as the hilum. So I'm gonna stop sharing at this point and show you a kidney that I plastinated. So the, the kidneys I have here are from pigs. They're not people. 
parts. Um, they're from pigs I got at the slaughterhouse out there at Perkinsville. So here's one of the kidneys. I left, this one just came straight out of the pig and then I obviously plastinated it. But I want you to see this outer connective tissue layer on it. And that is the serosa. So it's actually contained in this plastic layer. So other kidneys that have had that sort of connective tissue layer, it's this. So this is the surface of a kidney with the plastic, not plastic, with the serosa connective tissue. This is sort of some fat that's left on it. So on this kidney, you can see that this is the hilum right in here. This is the renal artery actually sticking out. The renal vein is just kind of wadded up over here to the side. So I didn't do a very good job with the renal vein. We have the renal artery. And then this is the ureter, taking the urine from the kidney all the way down to the bladder. But the important part on this particular specimen is the renal capsule is still intact, which is fairly unusual. Uh, here's another pair of kidneys that I got that were still connected. So this was a rare opportunity for me. Usually they just cut them out one at a time for me. So these two are connected together. You can still see in the um, aorta, which is here, and the inferior vena cava, which is there together. So there's just segments of the aorta and inferior vena cava so that we can have you can see how the kidneys are located. You have the ureters coming out as well as the arteries and veins still entering or exiting the hilum. So we'll go back to the screen share. There we go. So we can see now that's our external anatomy. Let me click on here. Okay. Um, I just have this particular picture here because you can see the kidney located here. I circled in red and it's got all the fat holding it, you know, in place. But the main thing is it's retroperitoneal. So if something ruptures out here in the intestinal area, um, out here, then the kidney is still protected from any bacteria that may escape from damage at that point. So the inside of the kidney, you're gonna need to know the anatomy of the kidney. So we have the cortex, the medulla, Within the medulla, we have pyramids, columns, we have um, minor calyces, major calyces, and going to the pelvis. So let's see here. I'm um, sorry. Okay, let me move sort of the video squares are in the way from where I was going to draw. So out here is going to be, oh, I should change the color. Just make it dark purple or something. So this here is the cortex. The cortex is this whole kind of outer area. And then we're gonna to go to the medulla next. Let me change the color for medulla. So the medulla includes, so I'm just gonna kind of circle it. What's the yellow is just going to scribble and then I could take the scribble off, but I just want you to see the range. That's the medulla. So the cortex is outside of that. Then there's the medulla. So within the medulla, we have the renal pyramids. I'll put a P to let you know the pyramids. Obviously there are these triangular components. That's the renal pyramids. The papilla is this portion right here at the bottom. It actually means nipple. So that's the papilla at the very bottom. And ultimately what's gonna happen in the papilla, let me change the color again, is urine is actually going to be formed in this space. We're gonna go through um, a nephron next. And within the cortex region, as well as the medullary region, Ultimately, urine is going to drip out of this little papilla into, I'm going to put little dots here, into the minor calyx. That's this first little receiving channel below each of the pyramids. And then you have a major calyx where they all start to converge together. So we have these major calyces here where the minor ones are the ones that are meeting up with an individual pyramid and the papilla portion at the bottom. 
and then ultimately leading into the renal pelvis, which is this interior portion. So we have, I think I have the next slide here. So on this slide, I just made it so we can look at the letters and we could name them. And so let me use the mouse. And so I'm gonna try to have you guys, um, sorry, try to make this so I can see the SLA videos again. So if you guys wanna use the chat feature or shout it out or something, I'll need a couple people to tell me what A is and then we'll do B and we'll kind of go through and you can tell me that you feel comfortable with the anatomy before we get on into the more deeper elements. So who can tell me what A is? Cortex. Yes, thank you. And what about, oh, I forgot to tell you. I didn't tell you B, oh, that's real nice. I skipped it in the last one. So B is actually renal columns because that's the space between the pyramids, okay? So I'll give you B. There you go, that was B. All right, so we'll go cortex is A, columns is gonna be B. And what's C? C is going to be a convert an area where this would be sort of the C area. Major calyx. Fantastic, thank you. So we're gonna do C there. And what is C, D? What's D? Renal pyramids. Thank you, perfect. Renal pyramids. And then um, E. I'll be where the funnel is starting to go out. Renal pelvis. Thank you very much. Okay, renal pelvis, that's E. And then finally, F, or not finally, we got one more after F. F is in here, let me do like where a F would be. This would be kind of an F area. This is like a little F. Minor calyx. Yes, thank you. And then finally, G, which is this little, component here. Renal medulla. That is the bottom, yes, the bottom of the renal medulla and then specifically it will be the renal papilla of the renal medulla. So that one's going to be G. Okay, fantastic. Thank you guys. Okay, now we know those basic parts. Here is the vessels. Now it looks a little intimidating, but if you notice one through five is pretty much, and those are all arteries, so that's what the little lowercase a stands for. And it's pretty much exactly the same as six through nine, just in reverse order. So if that cuts the knowledge base down. Hopefully you can just learn the arteries in their order and know the veins. Well, they're the same names, they just go in reverse order. In actual real life, there are a lot more variations in the vasculature when it comes to kidneys than pretty much anywhere else in the body. So this is sort of a general rule of thumb, but there in on any given individual, the vasculature could vary considerably. But we'll just sort of walk through this part. So we have blood first coming in through the renal artery. It separates into sort of different little regions. Now we're in the segmental. And then we go into inter or interlobar interlobar is gonna bring us between the pyramids. So that's interlobar. And then finally four is going to be the arcuate. Arcuate, I always think of it as, as arching around the top of the pyramids. So I always think arcuate is like it's an arc, um, like a rainbow arc or arch. It's going to arc around as the geometric figure or arch. So that's the arcuate artery. And then we go up into what sounds like I'm repeating myself, but it's not, is the interlobe ular. These are these little radiating lines out in the cortex going out. And so it distinguishes itself from interlobar because it has this extra U. So I like to think of it, what helps me think of it is if it's going, if I'm thinking of the top of the kidney, it makes sense. From the arcuate, if it's radiating at, outward, I always think of that's going up. So I think of the U and up as the U in interlobe ular. So that helps me. Now don't think of it, it's the same as going down, but I mean you have interlobe ulars down here, but at least it'll help you sort of differentiate them. 
So those are the main vessels going in. And then obviously the veins will return out. This middle portion that I have here um, is part of the vessels that are in the nephron that we're gonna spend more detailed time. So this is the microscopic components. So basically what we're doing is sending in blood via the interlobular artery, these ones radiating out on the cortex. It goes into this sort of nephron filtering system. This is just the blood vessel side of it. And then when you have the clean blood, the clean blood comes out this interlobular vein and then on its way back out ultimately to the renal vein, to the inferior vena cava, and it's clean. So you just sort of really think of the dirty blood coming in, it's getting processed by the nephron, and then the clean blood leaving. This is not one of my kidneys. We have one of these in the lab though. Um, Dr. Bronander years ago had done these. Um, some are really old, it was quite ahead of his time actually. This was done by some colleagues of mine down in Brazil. And so what they did is they injected a kidney with, and these are probably human kidneys because it's the medical school down there, but they injected them with a, uh, not latex, with a silicone. And they actually did a couple of different um, regions of vessels. So you can actually see in this one here, all of the arteries where it's going out, or this one's probably artery and vein combined. So you have some of the arteries, this top one, the, definitely the red is the arteries and the blue would be the renal vein. And the yellow is going to be the calyces and the ureter. So you can actually see the calyces look like these little leaf things in there. There are these little collecting areas it's going to ultimately go down into the renal pelvis and then out the ureter. So they, what they did is just casted the, um, injected these kidneys and then dissolved the actual kidney tissue away. Okay, so now we're on to the nephron. So the nephron is actually the little microscopic component within the kidney that's doing the filtering. And we have hundreds and thousands of nephrons. So we're gonna go through a single nephron and figure out all the parts of it, and then know that, hey, there's gonna be loads of these little guys all stacked up through the kidney and they're all doing the same thing. So we're gonna break it down to a single nephron, which is here. But I want you to notice in this larger picture right there, that larger side of things, notice that we have our, um, we'll just sort of do our anatomy, our basic anatomy. This is gonna be our cortex. We have our medulla. Obviously this is just a segment or a portion. This is gonna be our pyramid. And then this is our papilla going into ultimately our minor calyx. I'm gonna put an MC there and then so that's sort of the large anatomy structure. Remember we have our interlobar artery and vein here. We have our arcuate artery and vein here and our interlobular um, vessels sticking up. So I'll get rid of those there. So what I want to point out is in this general, use this, this whole anatomy, notice on our interlobe ular artery going up. So I have one line representing the interlobular artery and the circle shows it as like, look, it looks like some crazy Dr. Seuss Christmas tree. So the interlobular artery is the trunk, I guess, if you will, of the tree. It's the one line going up but then all of these little tiny bally things sticking off the ends, those I'm gonna give you the term now, but you'll see it's called the glomerulus is one. And so a glomerulus is actually the capillary component, the capillary bed, so a glomerulus is a single one, is a capillary bed going into a nephron. So we actually see it over here, it's just covered looks like this weird purple circle with these yellow, or sorry, with the red things that look like weird lips. Really the purple part is this capsule that surrounds it. And so the red lines are actually one of these little, you know, a blood vessel coming off of our interlobular artery going in there. We'll be going through this in a deeper sense, but I want you to know that a nephron is a single filtering unit but off of a single interlobular vessel, 
we have loads of nephrons that will be hanging off of them. So each one of these little bali components, like each glomeruli, is the start of an individual nephron. Okay, well hopefully this will sort out. This is another picture, it's a better picture. I stole from the Britannica, so I have a, I'm exerting my one use ability for teaching. So I'll have to find a better, a new one for next time I teach this. But what we're seeing is this again is the cortex. You can see the section here, down here is going to be our medulla. We have our arcuate artery that's across here, our interlobar right here, and then we have the interlobe ular coming up into the cortex. So if the interlobular is coming up into the cortex, here's its branch into one of those little bali things, a glomerulus. And so this is a single nephron over here. This one is another nephron. It just shows you the blood vessels around it, but you can see how crazy and messy it gets when you look at that one. So we're gonna be looking at a lot that's gonna be more like this side where we can just see the tubules, which is the green and the turquoise part. But on the right side, you can see the green and the turquoise part are wrapped around, blood vessels are around there. So um, this gives you a nice big picture and a big perspective of this. So the parts of a nephron that we're gonna be going through is the tubules. So that was sort of the green and turquoise elements in that last image. And then the vasculature just means it's the blood vessels. Those are the surrounding vessels. And then at the end of this lecture, we're gonna talk about these specialized cells that are part of it that help to modify how much we're filtering and, and what, how we're going to maybe affect red blood cell production or hormone levels. So this here is kind of our fine tuning. The main thing about our nephron that we really wanna focus on right now are these two, the tubules and the vasculature. So the job of the kidney, which is the job of a nephron, which is the fun functional unit or a single part, a nephron to the kidney is like a sarcomere to the muscles. You know, it's just one little part that you're going to go in to learn about, but what's happening at one point is, is multiplied over hundreds of thousands of times throughout that organ or tissue. So in the kidney, we have hundreds of thousands of nephrons. We first filter. We want to take the blood in. We want to filter out everything from the blood. And then what we do is we give back to the blood. Um, I guess that isn't. So we take everything out of the blood and then we only let the good stuff get back. And if there was still some bad stuff in the blood, then we secrete it and put it into the tubules. So I'm just gonna stop share for a moment. So how this thing works is that we have, um, so instead of like the liver, so we did the liver last time. And if for the liver, we had the hepatic, portal vein as well as the hepatic artery bringing <clears throat> blood into the liver that needed to get filtered. So it goes into the liver and it picks out the waste and that goes out the bile. Okay. So the liver, think of it as cherry picking out the, the waste. It just lets the blood come through and it's just grabbing the waste and pulling it out. The kidney does it differently. The kidney says at the level of the glomerulus, this capillary bed that we're going to start off with, um, it was a little bally things in that first picture. The kidney's approach to filtering is taking everything it can get out of the blood. It's going to take the water. It's going to take the glucose. It's going to take the good stuff. It's going to take amino acids, the food that we're eating. It's going to take, um, and it's going to take a bunch of waste. So it takes the good and the bad. It pulls as much stuff out of the blood as it can. So I like to think of it or have you conceptualize blood coming into this capillary bed that's going to start our nephron, our filtering unit, as bringing normal blood in that's got waste. It goes in the capillary bed, that nephron's pulling out everything that it can. It can't pull out big chunky things, so it can't pull out hormones, it can't pull out albumin. So it's pulling out a whole lot of water and smaller stuff, even glucose, so I like to think of the blood leaving this capillary bed after all of this stuff got sucked out as like sludge blood that's left. 
and the sludge blood is going to now be in the vessels coming around this nephron. And the whole, the first part of the nephron is filter, get all everything out it can, good and bad stuff. And then the first after that, then the kidney says, you know what, here's water, that's good, send that back to the blood. Here's some glucose, that's good, send that back to the blood. Oh, here's some potassium and magnesium, that's good, send that back to the blood. So the job of the kidney when it filters is says, I'm gonna take everything, but I'm only gonna send back the good. Whereas in contrast, the liver says, hey blood, I'm just gonna pull out any bad things I can see. So the kidney is a lot more thorough, taking everything it can get, but only sending back to the blood the good stuff. Now the terms secretion and reabsorption are very specific for which direction it's going. So when we say reabsorption, we mean stuff was in the tubules, we took out the good and bad, it's in the tubule, but we wanna send it back to the blood because it's good stuff like water and glucose and vitamins. That is called reabsorption, when we send good things back to the blood. Now secretion is where we have junk and waste that maybe be larger molecules that didn't in, get into, separated from the blood initially um, because the molecules were too big. And so secretion is where when we force molecules from the blood into the tubules. I'm going to fix that so I can get any Sorry, the guinea pig starts when I start talking and then she gets in this little thing where she starts drinking her water and it's super loud and I've had students complain about, it sounds like knocking on the door, so apologize for that. Okay, so I want you to just conceptualize, the kidney does three main things. Filtration, taking everything out it can. Reabsorption, send the good stuff back into the blood. Secretion, bringing any junk or waste that never filtered in the first place and force it into the tubule so it can go out via the pee. So I'm gonna go back to the screen share so we can go through this. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so these are the three main jobs of the kidneys, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. And you can see in the reabsorption part, that we ultimately reabsorb 99% of what we initially filtered. So it's sort of like a waste of time, you think, gosh, the kidney's doing a whole lot of work just to return 99% of what it took out in the first place. Well, the 1% is gonna go out as the urine. And so ultimately that's gonna how it at leaves. But I wanted you to have this sort of big picture view before we go on to the details. So this is a picture, it's not really a great picture, but it's one of the few pictures I, this is sort of like what I draw on the board. So if you watch those in-class videos that I recorded last semester that were done in the classroom, we draw something out on the board like this. We're gonna start with this little area. That's like the little bally things I said, looks like a Dr. Seuss Christmas tree. So it starts off with that part. That's where we filter, we're doing the filtration there. And then that's where I have in, you can see in the red, that's the blood vessels. So if we have say normal blood coming in, at this point here, this is where it's gonna get filtered. So now we have a whole bunch of junk that we're putting into this blue tubule here. And so then what's leaving this efferent arterial as I'll just call it sludge blood. Sludge blood is because you took out as much water as possible. You took out so much stuff except for the big chunky stuff because all of the stuff you took out is now in this tubule, which is in the blue. So then as we go through this first part of our tubule, this is where we're gonna do reabsorption. All of this stuff that we took out, we're actually gonna send it back to the blood vessel so that our blood is less sludgy and we're getting back closer to normal. So in this first section, we're doing a lot of reabsorption. We're gonna then go through this U-turn portion here and find out how we maximize even more water. So the U-turn part, which is a loop of Henle, is focused specifically on water, trying to get more water to get back into the blood and return. And then finally, 
we have one last tubule set here that we can either secrete and put any junk that was in the blood, move it back into the tubule, or bring some or modify anything with hormones. Our hormones are going to target this area. So we're going to go through this piece by piece. I just wanted you to have the big picture in mind as we go through some of these details. So this is a list of showing you the tubule part and I colored it in blue so it would match the blue of this slide. So it's just saying the tubule is all of this. This is where we remove the waste to. And so actually the stuff in the tubule is called filtrate and whatever stays in the tubule ultimately becomes urine. And so obviously the vessels on the right side of this slide, everything's written in red. And so it's matching the red that's here. So that's what's the blood. So we're saying here's the blood. We have the afferent arterial coming in. The glomerulus is our capillary bed. That's that little bally knot thing. And then the efferent arterial is where we have our sludge blood because the capillary bed is where we filtered it. This is why we'll say filtering. We do our filtering in the glomerulus. So we have our sludge blood in the afferent arterial or the efferent. Erase this. And then ultimately the capillaries that are going around, that's all of the, the red vessels here, they're called, you know, just peritubular capillaries. Your book will talk about vasa recta. I really don't care about the name. Just call the whole thing peritubular capillaries because they go around tubes. So this is the capillary is where our good stuff is going to go back into. And then finally we get to our interlobar vein and head back out the kidney. So I wanted you just to see the two lists. We either have the tubule part and that's the blue part here. So we're going to talk about this capsule. We have the proximal tubule. We have the lupa henle, and we have the distal tubule, and we have the collecting duct. So that's here. The capsule's at the start. We have that proximal convoluted tubule. We have that lupa henle. We have the distal one. And then ultimately the collecting duct that's going to end up in that papillary duct at the bottom of that renal pyramid. So here's another picture. This picture is, I believe, from your textbook. Um, and what it has is these different sections. So we're going to talk about this first part. It's a Bowman's capsule, and it's going to tell you it's going to fil filtrate removal. So it's doing the filtering. Then we're going to talk about this next part, and it tells you it's going to be mostly reabsorption. Then we're going to talk about the next part, um, the Lupa Henley, and we're focused on water. And then we finally are going to talk about this last part, the distal convoluted tubule. And this is where secretion is going to take place as well as hormone action. And then by the time you get into the collecting duct, it's going to be urine because lots of nephrons are going to be dumping into the collecting duct. Okay, so here we go. We're starting with the first part. We're going to go through the details here. So I have broken up the lecture into segments. So each section, I'm going to start with this picture and I'll just highlight in the red box what we're about to talk about. So right now, you see the big picture of the whole nephron, but now we're just going to talk about the area in the red square, the glomerulus, the afferent arterial, the efferent arterial, and the Bowman's capsule. So what we have in this area, I'm going to go right back here this guy here. So notice we have the blue shell, if you will, it's kind of opened up so we can see the red capillary ball capillary network. The blue shell is known as the Bowman's capsule and the red ball inside is the glomerulus. Those two things together are called the renal corpuscle. So that's what this is. So the renal corpuscle is here and what this here is actually a glomerulus because it's only stained for um, blood. But you can see in, this was our interlobular artery. And then it's going to come up. It's going to branch off to multiple afferent arterioles. So this one would go to a glomerulus on that side. But we just have a really good view of this particular one. Goes in, goes to this glomerulus capillary network. A lot of the fluid, so our Bowman's capsules around here is going to escape and the fluid is going to go out this way. 
So then that way, the efferent arterial that's leaving this glomerulus is going to be where our sludge blood is located. Erase all this, all right? So the renal corpuscle is made up of two parts, the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, those two together. The glomerulus is the blood vessel side of thing that you see in this particular picture, and the Bowman's capsule is like in this back picture, is the capsule around it. It's that purple part. So it's the start of the tubule. So this is where we have the blood in the glomerulus and the capsule is the tubule where fluid is leaving the blood out of the glomerulus and going into the capsule and only large molecules stay in the blood, which will ultimately escape via the efferent arterial. Then this is a close-up view of our afferent arterial is coming into the glomerulus. This itself is the glomerulus. So a whole lot of fluid, or sorry, let me get, change color here. I don't know why this is so difficult to change colors. So I'm just going to do this orange. This orange is representing waste water, the waste and goods. So it's coming out of the glomerulus ultimately, so I'm going to speak a more solid arrow here, is going to go out this direction, which is going to become in the proximal convoluted tubule, which is next. So the whole point of this renal corpuscle is we have blood in the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule around, we're separating. So the main thing here in red at the top of here is filtration. Filtration means we're taking fluid and dissolved solutes that was in the blood in the glomerulus and moving it to the tubule part, which is the Bowman's capsule. So this is a little different schematic. Some people like this more linear view where we have blood coming in. Let me change my color again. So we would have blood coming in, coming to the glomerulus, sludge blood leaving, but now the sludge blood is gonna go along the tubules so that we can actually return, reabsorb, and then we have clean blood here and waste that goes out here. So you're going to hear a term called glomerular filtration rate. And the main thing you need to know is in blue in this slide. The rest of it is more just to help you understand how it's measured or its importance. So first I want you to realize the glomerular filtration rate. So we have the glomerulus, that's that capillary bed. And it's just basically saying, hey, how much from our blood capillary bed are we able to filter? How much are we separating and getting out of our blood? So what is the rate of that? If you recall when we did the heart in unit one, cardiac output, cardiac output is the performance of how much the heart can pump blood in a minute because the job of the heart is to pump. Well, the job of the kidney is to filter. So the kidney's mark of performance is how much can it filter? in a minute. So it's really just like cardiac output, instead of pumping, it's filtering. So the glomerular filtration rate is how much is the kidney amount of filtrate that's produced per minute. So in a single minute, how much are you filtering? And this is one way to measure it. I don't, won't have you know, need to describe that on a test. I just is letting you know creatinine clearance is a way that you can measure how much creatinine came in. You can do a certain amount that you're giving the patient. And then over time, you're gonna measure their urine content over 24 hours, how much they're actually excreting. So it, um, it's not as easy of a determination as you'd think. It should, could be, but that's one way to measure it. And the importance here is I want to point out is if our blood pressure drops by only 20%, we won't have enough pressure to even do the filtration. So the kidneys actually are our main problem in raising blood pressure in our body, if for those of us that have hypertension out there. So if people have hypertension, 
that's because the kidney most often, now there's other factors, many other factors, but when our context here would be, is often driving it. So many of the medications that people take are actually blocking hormones that the kidney is sending out because the kidney is trying to raise blood pressure. The kidney is very good at raising blood pressure. That's because <clears throat> the kidney never wants blood pressure to drop. If it drops by just 20%, we can't even filter. So knowing someone's GFR, so we're gonna refer to this just as GFR, is important because it tells you how much is filtering and what the, the performance of the kidney. And that's, main, that's the main thing you need to know from this slide. <clears throat> that the glomerular filtration rate is how much the kidney filters in a minute and that the kidney's filtering ability is tied into our blood pressure. Some of the things that affect our glomerular filtration rate is our kidney can self-regulate. It can actually dilate or constrict the afferent or efferent arterioles to try to um, monkey with the pressure there in that glomerulus. We also have various hormones that can either increase our blood pressure or decrease our blood pressure that can either push harder on the sclerosis or not. So we can, that gets modified. And if we're stressed out, our sympathetic nervous system, we can actually then affect, negatively affect our glomerular filtration rate. So these are just some of the things that can affect how effectively our kidney is filtering. Now we're going to go on to this second part of the nephron. So we've already talked about the Bowman's capsule. I think I have a recap slide here. So no, I do not. I thought I did. Hmm. Okay, well, there is a recap slide for the Bowman's capsule somewhere. Now it's going to be somewhere out of context, obviously. So um, we're going to talk now about this proximal convoluted tubule. This is the first set of tubules after we filter. So in this proximal convoluted tubule, I first wanted to show you the picture of the kidney. So remember, we have our cortex and our medulla. And then specifically, that's the pyramid of the medulla. So this proximal convoluted tubule is actually just in the cortex. It is this wiggly part that's right after the Bowman's capsule. So the Bowman's capsule, you can see there as this purple ball, and inside that purple ball would be the glomerulus. And then the proximal convoluted tubule is the first wiggly part that's extending from that ball. So notice it's exclusive to out here in the cortex. And then the other important thing is, these tubules, if we were to take a histology slide and we slice our kidney like that and we look at it under a microscope, we can see that each of the tubules are made of little cuboidal cells. Now cuboidal cells are in almost all of our glands because the important thing with cuboidal cells is cuboidal cells are important for pumping. So glands are pumping out sweat or acid or whatever, or hormones. So glands are very much cuboidal cells. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect that's really important is only in the proximal convoluted tubule do you see little microvilli. And microvilli are sticking into the lumen where the fluid would be. The fluid would be in that little white circle area. The microvilli increase surface area. So I'm just going to draw, make this because you should put that in your notes. So microvilli increase surface area so that you can maximize reabsorption, which is what this is next part here. Just put an arrow there, that way I don't have to spell reabsorption again. So the microvilli increase surface, because this is where we have all of the stuff we just removed from our blood. So what is the stuff that gets reabsorbed? Well, 65% of our water gets reabsorbed at this point. Glucose, we bring all of our glucose back because that's good stuff. That's stuff our body needs. That's our fuel. 
amino acids. That's some more of our fuel. That's our food. So we bring 100% back during our proximal convoluted tubule here. We also have various other ions like sodium and potassium and chloride and magnesium and bicarbonate. And we have loads and loads of other things that's coming back. Vitamins also get brought back. So reabsorption, if you remember, is from the tubule into the blood. We're returning the good stuff. That's reabsorption. And the vast majority of it takes place here in the proximal convoluted tubule. This histology slide just shows you the glomerulus in the center. Um, the Bowman's capsule is really this white kind of arc around it. So that's where the fluid is going to go out into. But I like you to see this guy here is a proximal convoluted tubule. Notice they're really fuzzy on the inside. That's because of the microvilli, where this distal one here is more clear on the inside. It has no microvilli, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Because there's so little fluid left, we don't need the increased surface area by then. So, oh, here's my recap slide of the Bowman's capsule. So it's a little a couple slides late. So on this one, I wanted to point out, this is the recap here, where the renal corpuscle is that, and it's made up of the glomerulus. So I put it in red to match the capillary bed there, as well as the Bowman's capsule. That's this outer part here. So you can see that the two together are called the renal corpuscle and bringing blood into the glomerulus is the afferent arterial. Blood leaving that glomerulus is going to be the efferent arterial. And then this is the job. What did the renal corpuscle do? It's filtration. We are removing fluid and solutes away from the blood and we're going to go into the tubules. So ultimately we're heading now into this tubule network. The proximal convoluted tubule its job, so we're sort of recapping that now, is going to be primarily reabsorption. We took out so much stuff from the renal corpuscle and it's so full here in the proximal convoluted tubule that we want to return as much of the good as possible out of the tubule so it goes back into the blood. That is the whole point of reabsorption, and the proximal convoluted tubule does it. Now, what are some of the extra things we have? Remember, we have the microvilli. That increases our surface area, so we can do a lot more reabsorption. So by the time we're done with the proximal convoluted tubule and we're going into the rest of the nephron, the rest of the nephron is really just fine-tuning. The next section we're going to talk about is more about getting extra water out. And this last part is more about dumping, you know, extra stuff. So we've really done our main reabsorption here in this proximal convoluted tubule part. So oh, there we go. Made, majority of reabsorption is happening here. That's important. So renal threshold. What the renal threshold is, and I just have glucose, it's value for glucose. I have it circled because that's the only one that I'll ask you directly about or that you should know the actual number, numeric value for. Um, amino acids, I'm giving you a number for it, but I'm just more as comparison. So I'm gonna explain this renal threshold to you. The, what the renal threshold is, I'll just stop share for a moment. The renal threshold is really what the maximum amount that you're gonna reabsorb back into your blood, that's the good stuff. If you, um, for instance, the number for glucose was 180 and the renal threshold, that means the threshold, the amount that you can bring back into the blood, that you're returning back to the blood out of the filtrate is 180 milligrams per, or mil, uh, milligrams per deciliter. Now, if you're diabetic and you have, say, 230 milligrams, you know, per deciliter, you're over it by 50, right? Well, if your renal threshold means that's it, how much you're going to reabsorb, you, you're taking back 180. And in a normal person, that's just fine. And so you get 100% of your glucose back. But if you're the diabetic with 230, with 230, that leaves 50 
left over that you're going to leave in the filtrate. So a person that's diabetic has blood glucose levels that's higher than 180. Whatever the amount above 180 is going to stay in the filtrate and end up going out in the urine, and you can actually detect their glucose in the urine. So you can tell if somebody's diabetic by doing a P test. Here's a cup do a diptych test, and if there's glucose in it, then you know, well, gosh, they definitely have higher than 180. Because if a person had less than 180, it would have all just gone back to the blood. None would be left in the filtrate. So the threshold, meaning the point that it's not going to bring any more back, is 180. So if you have higher than that, you're going to have stuff in the, in the um, tubule. Amino acids, it has a lower threshold. So if you're at 65, just for reference, I'm just saying it could be very, whatever um, solute or item it is, it's going to have its own special independent number. So amino acids are at 65. So if you eat a really, really high protein meal and you exceed that 65, you're going to have protein coming out in your urine because your kidney says, I'm only returning 65. Glucose, I'm only returning back to the blood 180. And under normal circumstances, that's plenty. And that really means all of it. But under pathological circumstances that your kidney's not returning it appropriately or you have too much of it, then it's going to end up in your urine. So the threshold, that's what it means. Um, the other thing on that slide is about vitamins. So I have vitamins. Some vitamins have a really, really low renal threshold. B vitamins, for example, have a very low renal threshold. We need B vitamins. So if anyone's experienced taking, eating a vitamin, or not eating, swallowing a vitamin, I guess, and then in about an hour when they go to the bathroom again, they have really bright fluorescent yellow pee. That's usually a, some, a mark of B vitamins leaving. It didn't necessarily mean that your body's just wasting, well, you're kind of wasting it, but your body's not using B vitamins. It just means we have a really low renal threshold for water-soluble vitamins. B vitamins are one of those. So it means our body used some of it, but that pill that you took as a vitamin had too many. So that's why usually high quality vitamins when you read the label, you're like, what? I'm going to get this amount of B vitamins, but I have to take like three to four pills throughout the day. I don't want to do that. I just want it all in one pill. Well, then you'll pee most of it out. By having the quality vitamins, they're trying to titrate it to match your renal threshold so that the vitamin that you bring in is actually just going to get utilized in your body. So you need smaller doses over a longer period of time so that you don't pee it all out via your renal threshold. All right, go back to the screen. Okay, so we have here, what the point is what you should know from here is that the renal threshold is the limit of how much we're going to reabsorb. The glucose, you need to know that it's 180 milligrams per deciliter, um, and that's the limit. So if somebody had higher than 180, whatever the difference would be, that's what's going to remain in the tubules in, in, in the fluid known as filtrate and will ultimately go out via the urine. Okay, oops, it's not advanced. Here we go. Now we're going to go into the loop of Henle. So this next part, we're really done with reabsorbing all of our ions and as much as we can um, of other stuff. And now Lupa Henley, we're just going to focus on water. This is our, our main thing is water, but how do we get water? There are no water pumps to reabsorb. We have to pump sodium and we'll ignore chloride for now, but we have to pump sodium and water follows by diffusion. So we actively move sodium when we want water to go somewhere. Even in the proximal convoluted tubule, we would pump out sodium to go say this is a blood vessel here, pump out sodium, I'm going to change colors here to blue, and then water, I'm just going to wiggle it, it's H2O, will follow. So we have to actively pump sodium, our, we, our body puts ATP effort into moving sodium, and then water just diffuses and follows it. So with that principle in mind, we're going to figure out the two sides of this loop because one side's all about sodium and the other side is all about water. We have, this is a zoomed in view of this loop. 
And I want you to notice that we have a really wide limb or a segment, and then we have a really narrow segment, okay? So we start with the going down. That's gonna be the descending limb. It's really narrow. It's made of really thin, simple squamous cells that are really ideal for diffusion. Then, let me just change the color here. The ascending limb is next, and you can see that it's really thick. And that's because it's gonna have cuboidal cells, which are really, really good for pumping stuff, specifically sodium. And then I should have circled water, H2O down below. So that's the two main things. The ascending limb is made of cuboidal cells, so it's also known as the thick limb. The thick limb is known as the ascending limb. There's all kinds of different names. It's thick because it's made of cuboidal cells, which are ideal for pumping. And what we're doing is the pumps here, that's these little green circles, ignore the chloride part, but it's just really taking all of any sodium that was in here, it's taking it and it's moving it out. So inside this hairpin turn tissue area, we're hyper concentrating sodium. We're just trying to move as much sodium out so we have as much sodium concentrated in this middle area as possible. So that's the whole point of the pumps on this side. Then I'll go back to the blue. Then the thin side coming down, so any new filtrate coming down into this area, the water is just going to diffuse its way out because it's so concentrated in the middle with sodium that it's drawing extra water out of the filtrate and into the tissue, ultimately it'll be into the blood. And so the descending limb has squamous cells that are flat. It's ideal for diffusion. And what do we want to diffuse out? Water. So we first hyper concentrate the U-turn area with sodium so that the new filtrate coming down will have extra water that will escape out. So we have less water that's gonna end up in the tubule and less water that we pee out of our body. So it's a way for our body to maximize water reabsorption and keeping as much water in our body and minimizing how much we pee it out. The process, as if we were to sort of actually numerically look at the concentrations, so I don't, care, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to test questions, but the numbers here are really going through, and it's a counter current multiplication. The way the concentrations are going of pumping out sodium to hyper concentrate to maximize diffusion is just called counter current multiplication. So the summary slide I have here for the loop of Henle is our main focus is going to be reabsorption of water. We really don't care of anything else except for we have to reabsorb sodium in order to get the water. So we actually focus on sodium in the loop of Henle just to get the water to come out. So then as we break it down, this descending limb is made of our simple squamous cells. And this is where our water diffuses out because we want it to get back in the blood. The ascending limb is thicker. It's made of cuboidal cells. And what it's doing is pumping out sodium so that we have sodium. I'm trying to make it NA, but it's really not working very well. So this is NA and lowercase a for sodium. It's trying to pump out sodium into this space so that then the water will diffuse into it and follow it. Now we're gonna to go to the last part of this nephron, which is the distal convoluted tubule. In the distal convoluted tubule, so again back, we're back only up in the cortex because it's just the wiggly part up here in the cortex area. We had the proximal convoluted tubule that's also wiggly, that's why it's called convoluted, and the distal. Both of them are high up in the cortex. It's also simple cuboidal, but notice I don't have the word microvilli. I deleted it. That's because these guys have no microvilli on the inside. There's so little filtrate left that we don't need the extra villi for surface area because 
it's not very much is left. So this is a place where we do secretion. Secretion means we're going from the blood, any waste, I'm just gonna put waste, waste in the blood, we're gonna pump it into, I'm gonna make this here, the distal convoluted tubule. So we go from blood into the tubule. And so secretion is moving it that way where reabsorption was obviously the other way around. So what do we secrete? All kinds of big chunky things that never got filtered in the Bowman's capsule in the first place. So we have like ammonium, creatine, urea, a lot of our drug metabolites like penicillin, we're gonna pee that out, but it's too big to get filtered in that glomerulus. So it's waste, it's stuff that we want to get rid of, but it stayed into the blood. And so this is our last shot at getting rid of this extra waste, dumping it into the distal convoluted tubule before it goes into the collecting duct to be urine. So at this distal convoluted tubule, we're secreting large chunk waste that didn't get filtered, but also our body can fine tune blood volume by targeting the distal convoluted tubule. If we had antidiuretic hormone, as you guys recall from unit one, which came from the posterior pituitary gland and it helps you retain water. Remember we called this the don't pee hormone. So example, if antidiuretic hormone is now gonna target our distal convoluted tubule, it pretty much says kidneys, let's bring back to the blood even more water. So again, don't pee. It's making less urine because it's returning more water to the blood. In fact, aldosterone is going to do exactly the same. And we'll go into these in more detail, but suffice it to say to make your notes complete, both of these are going to retain water. And they will do that. It's going to increase our blood volume because we're putting the water into the um, blood, which will equals to increasing blood pressure. So antidiuretic hormone will actually raise your blood pressure. Aldosterone will raise your blood pressure. And some blood pressure medications are known as aldosterone inhibitors. Um, then the, ex the other one that I want you to really, we're gonna focus on is we have Atrial natriuretic factor, also known as atrial natriuretic peptide. This is the only hormone that we have in our body that's actually going to let more, oops, more, or more water into the filtrate of the distal convoluted tubule, which means more pee or more urine, which is actually going to drop our blood volume and our drop blood pressure. So atrial natriuretic factor is the only hormone that our body makes that actually reduces blood pressure. And again, I have more slides that are focused specifically on these hormones. So to summarize where we are with just the distal convoluted tubule, it's the end of our nephron. We're doing secretion where we dump out any extra waste that didn't get dumped out in the first place by filtration. And then this is where hormones of our body are gonna to target to fine tune our blood volume. So this is a, some, a little bit on the hormones. So aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, this is a slide of basically what I just said. The two of them are gonna retain water. And of course it does it because it's increasing sodium pumping back. So it's increasing blood volume, therefore increasing blood pressure. Change the color here. Therefore, and then atrial natriuretic peptide is actually going to increase sodium secretion. Remember, that's gonna go back into the filtrate and it's going to decrease um, our blood pressure and it's going to actually increase our urine volume. So this is our summary slide for the distal convoluted tubule. Secretion, 
We're getting rid of the larger solutes out of the blood and into the tubule. So that's this direction. So that's secretion, where reabsorption is the opposite direction. Then we do secretion of water specifically. That means removing more water out of the blood and into the filtrate. So that's going to lower blood pressure. So that's the one that actually atrial natriuretic peptide does. And then we also could do water reabsorption depending on the hormone. So these two, whatever's going to happen, whether we secrete water or we reabsorb water, it all depends on which hormone is circulating in our body at any given time. So the hormone is determining whether secretion is happening or reabsorption with regard to water specifically. So this is where hormones are targeted in this region, secretion or reabsorption of H2O water. I forgot to subscript the two. So here's a bit of a summary. Our proximal convoluted tubule have microvilli because there's so much filtrate and we need extra surface area to get most of it reabsorbed back to the blood. Our distal convoluted tubule is pretty wide open, so we don't have microvilli there um, because there's less fluid, but it's, that's the location where we're secreting, dumping extra waste, or letting our hormones modify the water direction. Finally, when we're done with our nephron and we're done reabsorbing, doing the loop of Henle extra water, doing the um, distal convoluted tubule, secreting out waste, what ultimately comes into this guy here, I'm just gonna color it in green and I'll erase it, is in this picture here on the right side, the reddish color, this is our distal convoluted tubule, it's going to dump stuff into this collecting duct. So this here shows two different nephrons dumping the what's left over of the filtrate, that's the fluid in the, um, in the tubule, into this collecting duct. So it's receiving from lots of nephrons, ultimately going down from the cortex up here, down into the medulla, and then this part right here is our papilla, which is at the bottom of the pyramid, and you're literally, all these little holes here, it's literally going drip, drip, drip of urine. I'm doing little drips coming out of here. So these collecting ducts are just constantly dripping out urine, kind of like a drip coffee maker. So if you've got a little coffee maker and you got your little filter and then you got, you know, coffee dripping into the container below it, that's just like urine dripping out of a papilla, out of the collecting duct. So it's now called urine. Um, once it's out there. I usually just call it urine once we're in the collecting duct. Actually, there's some variations. Um, there's still some modification that can happen in the collecting duct. I just don't have you know them. I mean, so I know in some of the, in Muchna's uh, 202 class, he talks about more of the uh, adjustments that occur in the collecting duct, but it's so little that I just ignore it. So I want you to be back to knowing glomerulus, and Bowman's capsule is the filtration. We have proximal convoluted tubule reabsorption. We have Lupa Henley maximizing water reabsorption. Distal, we either reabsorb more water or we dump out more water. We have um, secretion that takes place. And then finally, we're done with it. So for the, my, the purposes of my class, we're done with it by the time we get to the collecting duct. Although in reality, there are some additional modifications that can be made, but they're pretty minor. So I'd rather you focus on the parts of the nephron. And then this is now urine, now going to the bottom, dripping out into the minor calyx. Okay, I forgot why I have that. I think I just have this one here as just letting you, so I could draw it on here. I think that's why I did that. Let me do black, just purple. So if you remember, we have our interlobular artery. It's going to go out to our glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. We have our proximal convoluted tubule. Lupa Henley is going to go down. We have our distal convoluted tubule, and then it's going to ultimately go into a collecting duct where lots of nephrons are, and it's going to end up at this papilla dripping out urine into this minor calyx. So notice that I drew this nephron all kind of stretched out. 
where we have an interlobular artery and afferent arterial, glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, proximal, lupa Henle, distal, and then to the collecting duct. In truth, this is actually folded over on itself. I draw them stretched out because it's a lot easier to figure it, to see it and see all the parts, but the reality of how it's shaped is a little different than that. So this is the non-reality. This is another um, image that came from the Pearson textbook. Um, so I, I have in a moment, we'll see how it really is set up, but let's just summarize. The renal corpuscle, you should know corpuscle means glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. And then that's main job there is filtration. The glomerular filtration rate is how much this is happening per minute. How, what's the volume per minute? Then we have the proximal convoluted tubule where its main job, let me change the colors here, is going to be reabsorption. This is where most of the filtrate is reabsorbed at this location in the proximal convoluted tubule. This is also where we have our renal threshold. So if we have some too much of some things, whether it's glucose or amino acids or vitamins, that we still reabsorb that up to the point of its renal threshold. And then if you have more of that substance, if we absorb amino acids up to the point of 65, but if you have, you know, 100, then 35 is going to get left into the filtrate. So you're not going to absorb all of it if you have too much. So the renal threshold is just the limit of its reabsorption. Then we have, let me pull, I don't know why it keeps doing that. change colors. Then as far as a lupa Henle, you should know the descending limb is going to be thin and because it has simple squamous cells for, re, for diffusion of water. Then you have the ascending limb, which is the thick limb because it has cuboidal cells because it's pumping sodium. Its job is mainly reabsorption because it's bringing it out of the tubule. And then finally, the bottom, the distal convoluted tubules where we have secretion, which is the large chunky stuff that didn't get filtered in number one, and reabsorption, so it can go either way depending on which hormones um, are, as far as water, secretion is just the waste one way from the blood to the filtrate. Okay, I'm gonna do the stop share. Okay, you guys are still there. So that's a lot of information. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, on the slide where it's talking about the arteries, you have the interlobal artery. Um, the veins, there wasn't an interlobal vein. Is there an interlobal vein or is it just a segmented one the entire time? There should be an interlobar, but sometimes it isn't. But I thought I put one in there. I tried to just rewrite them. So let me have a quick look on here. I was. Oh, you're, yeah, I missed it. Okay, yes, I did not put it on there. You can have it on there. In reality, it is there sometimes and sometimes it's not there. But I intended to put it on the slide where it was just the same exact ones in reverse order. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So let's see, I'm just going to look here. So the next part that we have is this juxtaglomerular apparatus but it's more about how we fine tune stuff. So I think what we'll do is, let me get out of here. I'm just looking at it. I know it's not screen share. I was checking it out while on there. So I think what we'll do is we'll just stop our lecture for today as far as so that gives you a chance to review it, go through your notes, update your notes so that when we come back, We'll talk about how the nephron really is folded back onto itself, the significance of that. It'll give us a chance to do kind of a recap summary uh, of that. And then we'll talk about the elements in the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And then we'll move on into talk about urine formation. And, um, and I think we have time now that we'll be able to um, maybe either do our acid base or be able to um, move that out. So I'll see where we are and paste on the next um, lecture. So we'll stop this for now, and then I'll see you guys on Monday. Um, I'm gonna work on today posting 
will be in your announcements a link to um, a place for that you can sort of sign up and just do an office hour with me if you wanted to go through your test. Um, I believe if you need to get a hold of me, I thought I put my cell phone um, in the class last time. So if I did, if I didn't, let me know. Otherwise, you can text me if that is easier for you too. But um, I won't be doing that. I won't be able to meet with anyone till Friday um, because I'm still proctoring tests all the rest of today and eight to eight tomorrow and to get through all of my three online classes. So, okay. So if you guys all just recorded this, so I'll post this, but you guys already have your in-class videos that you could be watching too. This one was just a different one to match the current um, slides. So if that helps you, I'll have them posted too as an alternative for day one for the urinary system. It'll be in the in-class lecture section. And, um, and then I wanted to also encourage you guys to, you know, keep doing your homeworks. Um, ideally, the homework should be done before the exam. I noticed a lot of folks, particularly the folks that were a little less successful than they probably wanted to be on the exam, did their homework after the test. And the whole point of the homework is really to help you prepare because they're actually what most of the homework are the exact test questions. So in this last unit, I just wanted to um, point out since we're doing something new with this unit, the questions are still relevant because there's still areas that I think are important that I would ask um, questions about. So I just wanted to encourage you to do the practice quizzes. Again, the folks that were less successful on the exams compared to the ones that um, were more successful, um, they did all the successful ones really did most of the practice quizzes. The less successful folks did maybe one or two when there was, I think, eight of them available to do. So again, those resources are there not just to waste your time. They're actually intended to be there to help you focus your studying and to um, help you do better on the exams. So uh, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Otherwise, wait on um, Friday will be the first day that we can do some student online student hours and you can sign up for a time. All right. Thank you, guys.